This lesson deals with the properties of inductance. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 ebook in chapter 6 starting on page 12. Well, so far in the course we've introduced eight different types of circuit elements, and we're about to introduce our final one. It's called inductance. The symbol for inductance is shown here as a squiggly line, and it's indicative of how we're actually going to make the inductance. If you label the voltage across the inductance, then with our passive sign convention we'll have current entering the plus terminal and leaving the minus terminal. The relationship between voltage and current is a little different for this device. The voltage across the device is equal to the inductance times the derivative of the current through it with respect to time. So if we were to draw a plot of voltage on the x-axis and then the derivative of current on the y-axis, we would then get a straight line with a slope of 1 over L. Now if you look at this equation and look back at what we had for capacitance, it looks very similar. We had that I is equal to C dV dt. Here we've got voltage where current was and likewise over here, and then capacitance has been replaced by inductance. In circuit theory, this is called duality. We'd really seen some of this earlier in the course when you look at Ohm's law as V equals IR, and you can also write that as I is equal to G times V. And so we had properties like series resistances. We had a similar idea with resistances in parallel, but their conductance is added. And so in that particular theorem, we're replacing voltage by current and then conductance for resistance. Now for the capacitance, we had Q was equal to C times V, and the energy was stored in the charge of the capacitance. The analogous idea for inductance is a thing called flux linkage, and we're going to use this symbol lambda, and it refers to the lines of force that we create very much like that of a magnet. The units for this are named after a German physicist, Wilhelm Weber. Now, with this relationship for the capacitance, we had taken the derivative of this, which is the current, dQ dt, and its relationship then with a capacitance times the derivative of voltage. Here the derivative of the flux linkage is actually the voltage across the coil. Let's figure out the units on inductance. So to make this voltage on this side of the equation, and here I've got amps per second here, I'd have to have units here that are going to be volts and then times seconds per amp. This was renamed after Joseph Henry who had did some work with inductances. We'll talk more about flux linkage in ECE 202 when we describe a thing called a transformer. Again, given this mathematical relationship, and again for the inductance this is true for all time, we can make some observations. If we're working in a circuit that has a constant current, in other words a DC circuit, and the derivative of that current then is zero, and so the voltage across the inductance, when I have a DC current flowing through it, is a short circuit. And again, this will be in steady state. We'll take a look at some of these ideas in chapter seven and kind of define what exactly that means. We can also make another observation here, and that is if we have an abrupt change in current as you go from one level to another. Well, as you're making that transition from one to the other, you have an infinite slope. And that means that you would have to have an infinite voltage if you were able to change the current instantaneously in a coil. Of course, that's not possible. So we can use this as a boundary condition. We'll do this in chapter seven, in that the current through an inductance cannot change instantaneously. Maybe an example of something you might have observed over the years is that if you run like a vacuum cleaner and you unplug it while it's running, and again, you shouldn't do this, you might see that the wall outlet gets bright or lights up. And what's happening is you're trying to change the current instantaneously by unplugging it. And so the voltage starts to rise very rapidly and it breaks down the air. And then you get an arcing between uh, voltage in the wall and the plug that you're pulling out. And again, if you pull it far enough away, the arc can't reach it and it extinguishes. But it's an example of trying to change the current quickly that very large voltages are created. In fact, we'll use this to do the spark gap. So for an inductance, we have that the voltage is equal to L di dt. Why don't we solve for the current in terms of the voltage? Let's integrate both sides of the equation, dt. Now let's integrate from some time t0 to t1, both sides of the equation. And again, here we've got a cancellation of the dt's. And the inductance is just a constant, so we're going to pull that out in front. And then if I integrate 1 di of t, it's just simply i of t at the upper limit minus i of t at the lower limit. Now I can solve for i of t1, that's the value of i at some point in the future. So divide by l, so I get 1 over l, integral from t0 to t1, v of t dt, and then plus i of t0. This is called, again, the initial condition. This is the value that we start with, and then we're going to add to that current 
the integral of the voltage over the interval of interest and then divided by the inductance. Yeah, a lot of people don't like to have the T1 here, so we could do a change of variable, replace T1 by T. You shouldn't use T here now because a girl with DT and having a T here means something very different. So we're just going to use a dummy variable here, X. So this will be our general equation for the current through an inductance based on the voltage across it. If we call back from chapter one, we had that power was related to the derivative of energy. So again, let's take a look at some of the properties of inductance with energy and power. Integrate both sides of the equation, dt, and these will cancel. And have the integral of 1 d of w of t, and that's going to be upper limit minus the lower limit. So again, I could solve for the value of the energy absorbed by the inductance at some time in the future. Put this on the other side of the equation. So I've got the integral of power, dt. What's power? It's voltage times current. And what is this term? This is really the initial condition or the energy that's absorbed by the inductance at time t equals t0. We can do a change of variable, and so we have that w of t is equal to the integral from t0 to t, but now v of x, i of x, dx, plus the initial condition. What is the voltage across the inductance? Well, it's L di dt. We're now using the dummy variable of x, so I can substitute that in. The dx is cancel. Pull out the L, it's just a constant. I'm going to integrate basically x dx. So then I have 1 half i squared of t, and then times L, and then I've got the same thing at t0 times L, and, then, and plus W of T0. Now what is this term equal to? Well this is the energy that's absorbed at T equals T0. Well that's also what this is, and so these two are canceling each other. And so the energy stored in inductance is only dependent upon the value of current that it currently has. So it's 1 half L times I squared. Very similar to the capacitance. I said before that power is related to the derivative of energy with respect to t, so we take the derivative of this with respect to t. Now, half and l are not a function of time. We got the derivative of i squared of t dt. This can be positive or negative. We take a sine function and square it, you get a cosine function of twice the frequency, but it has a positive and negative slope. So it's possible for the inductance to absorb power and then also to generate it. But the energy is only absorbed. So just like the capacitance, this is like a pitcher filling up with energy, and then we can take it back out again. So the inductance is also a storage device. It takes energy in, gives it back to you. But it can't give you any more than, than you've given it initially. And so these are some of the properties of inductance.